folks, you won't have heard the previous conversation that Clint and I have been having, but hopefully the one that we'll have over the next 20 minutes or so will encourage you and, and help you out. We are looking at the book of Psalms, and uh, in this study that we're looking at, it actually divides the Psalms into five categories. Uh, there's other studies that divide it into three, and then, of course, there's always some that would divide it into even more than that. Um, just to help us get an understanding of the purpose of these Psalms, they were accumulated, they were uh, gathered by the Jewish scribes over years and years, treasured, used by their uh, singers, used in their worship assemblies, and so it's a great opportunity for us to just kind of get in there and learn how to take them, uh, understand them in our context, understand them as God would have us to understand his nature. And that's one of the things that you will find constantly throughout the Psalms is the psalmist recognizing how God is at work uh, in moments and places. So we're going to kick off here and Clint's going to teach uh, from one of the Psalms from one of the sections and uh, we'll comment on that and then we'll do another opportunity with another psalm from another section and I just would encourage you to uh, Clint may mention it here in just a minute but we were just talking about how we bring our cultural ideas and our cultural understanding of words to these passages and we read them like that and one of the great challenges for me was understanding uh, the psalms and actually reading them through the the translation called the message and I know a lot of people have problems with that because they think it was hastily and and uh, otherwise done but let me just remind you of why Eugene Peterson said he wrote the message he said he used he wrote it for two reasons number one he said he realized that the people in his church were not reading their scriptures regularly and he felt like there was a language barrier in them understanding them number two he said he realized there were some deep seated realities in their lives that they didn't notice in their everyday life and he felt like that the Psalms would reveal those to him and so when he went back and tried to translate them into plain English um, he used that to try to do that so Clint's going to kick us off here uh, with a Psalm and uh, we'll get started in our study yes and notice he said with a Psalm not a song y'all don't want me to start singing <laughs> um, I'm glad that we get a chance to do this <clears throat> by the way this is the book uh, we can get it for you if you want to yep. order it through the office. Uh, Psalms, Character of God. I appreciate Brother Derwin yesterday morning's sermon out of Psalm 1. He said it's kind of foundational, you know, kind of uh, getting us started there with what a, a righteous man lives like and someone who's not righteous and what happens. And so I appreciate that. I'm going to be talking about Psalm 22, 23, and 24, those three. And uh, in prayer meeting the other night, I kind of kicked this off a little bit with Psalm 22. Psalm 22 is very interesting to me and became a lot more interesting as I studied through it because you get a, uh, a kind of a flipping back and forth between David who uh, wrote the psalm and David, whatever he was facing at that time in his life, and Jesus on the cross. And there's a, a back and forth in there. And uh, I did, in some background research, uh, come across a comment that said the earliest believers in Christ in the earliest church believed that this particular psalm was prophetic because they saw it after you know Jesus died on the cross, resurrection and all of that. And so looking back through that lens, they could see, oh yeah, that's what David was talking about. Maybe David didn't actually know, mm -hmm. but that's what he was talking about through the work of the Holy Spirit. So, um, and, and I'll try to give you a few references, New Testament references, but I won't take time to read all that because this video could last two hours if we really get too deep. But in verse one, one of the most famous quotes in the New Testament. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? If you're in the King James Version. All right. That's not New Testament. That's Psalm 22.1, but it's also found in Matthew 27. All right. Jesus on the cross. And uh, so immediately the Psalm starts David crying out to God in his unique situation at that time. But the words he's saying were the words of Christ 
several hundred years later. And so you go down through the psalm and, and you see some of this stuff and, and I'll try not to go too long and burn up our time. Verses 2 through 5 is David dealing with his uh, unique situation. And he says, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not in the night season, I'm not silent. Uh, thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee, they trusted in Thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. Now, my Bible version here is not King James, and I'm glad he's using not King James because we get different views here. But here in this section, David's crying out. He's got, I got a problem. I cry out. It seems like you're not listening to me. But yet I know in the past you listened to us and you answered. So he, he, he's, he's got his faith there in God, but he's still crying out and like a lot of us today, you know, you get in trouble and you got you got a situation in life and you're just crying out to God, you know, and, and you don't see or hear an answer coming. But you can't, you got to be like David. You got to continue with the faith. And I tell people all the time, be honest with God. He already knows what's in your heart. You don't understand why he's not answering? Tell, ask him, why aren't you answering? He understands. You know, you wind up talking like David when you do that. Um, and then he comes to verses 6 through 8, and it's really here we flip back over to Jesus on the cross. And it describes Jesus' situation with people laughing at him, making fun of him, that kind of stuff. Uh, then come down to, to 9 and 10, and you're back to David again in his unique situation. But it also seems that Jesus might have said these words as well. Uh, 9 and 10 you took me from the womb, making me secure while at my mother's breast. I was given over to you at birth. You have been my God from my mother's womb. Jesus could have said those words. And David felt that as well for himself. And uh, then we go to verse 11, 12, and 13, and you're back with David and his unique situation. And he refers to something. And Daniel and I were talking earlier, and he may or may not say it's over in Psalm 75, one of the Psalms he's going to talk about. There's a term over there about a horn, and most of us don't understand when we read that. Well, here in Psalm, there's, it's not really talking about a horn, but he's talking about the strong bulls of Bashan. And most of us just skim through that. We don't know where that place was at. We don't know what they were, and we just yep. trust it. You know, Big it, cows. It, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and yet... It was an actual place that was on the other side of the Jordan River. It was a very fertile region, and it was famous for having big, strong bulls. And that these things were dangerous. And that's where he gets this from. Wow. In his world, in his world, all those evil people who were after him, it was like he was ringed by big, strong bulls that he was totally defenseless against. And this is a guy talking who killed bears and yep. lions and faced all kind of danger. He's not a coward. <laughs> so anyway, understanding a little background can, can kind of help you there. Um, both Jesus and David flip-flopping here, I know. But Jesus and David could have could have thought thoughts like this. Jesus there was going through the persecution of that last 24 hours of his earthly life. Then you go on down to 14 and you get back to where we as New Testament Christians would see this and say, oh, he's talking about Jesus here. My, I'm poured out like water. My bones are all out of jo a joint. My heart is like wax. It's melted in the midst of my bowels. And you go on and read all of this. And it's a really good physical description, verses 14, 15 uh, of Psalm 22. It's a really good physical description of Jesus on the cross. Now, some of us will remember when Jesus was hanging on the cross, other than nail his hands and feet to the cross and put the crown of thorns on his head, the only other real physical thing they did to him, other than well, they beat him and spit on him, but they stuck a spear in his side. Mm -hmm. And the Bible tells us that what gushed out was like water. There's that reference. Now, I actually did a little study on the physical part of crucifixion uh, years ago. A Christian surgeon or doctor actually wrote some stuff about this and what happened physically to Jesus' body as he was nailed and hanging on that cross 
and how things begin to break down within the body and what how bad it was. And uh, you read this, uh, he's talking about his bones are all out of joint. Well, that's the way he would have felt after a while. I mean, his shoulders are coming disjointed, the pressure on, on, his, on his spinal cord, the pressure on his knees, his hips, his feet have nailed through them. That hurts real bad. He tries to hang by the arms to get the pressure off the feet. That hurts real bad. He lets it go the other way. He's hurting real bad on the other end of the body. Just back and forth, all kind of stuff. The heart stops working, and basically today I think it's called congestive heart failure, where that sac fills up with water. But that's the kind of stuff that was happening to him. So David, writing hundreds of years ago, is talking about something like that. So we go on down, and we get through the part about the garments being parted and, and all of this. The reference to dogs that's there, a lot of us read that in scripture, and uh, we don't understand today um, what that really, how bad that is. Now, people in parts of uh, the Middle East do because they still have, and in northern India, they still have wild packs of dogs that roam free in the cities, and they attack people. So this this is understood. Yeah. Um, so anyway, we, we go on down through this. Now, the study in Psalms is on the character of God. So what do we see here about God's character? Well, number one, um, God is sovereign. He's sovereign over everything. He is sovereign over everything. He knows through his providence what is going to happen, how it's going to play out, and how he's going to use it for his glory. So we talk about character of God, he is sovereign. Uh, he knows everything. There's nothing going to happen. And I used to tell missionaries this when I would train these new missionaries going out there to the field. And I knew they were going to face a lot of uh, sometimes awful things because we did. We all did. But I would tell them, look, God called you to that place. He already knows what it's like there. He knows what you're going to face. Nothing you run across is going to catch God off guard. He's not going to be surprised by what happens to you. He's there with you, and he will walk you through it. And so that, that's a little bit of the character of God there. Now, uh, Psalm 23, that's probably one of the more famous psalms in the Bible. And uh, these pages are so thin, it's hard to turn. The Good Shepherd Psalm. Lord is my shepherd, there's nothing I like. Now, this is not King James, so it's going to sound a little different. Uh, he lets me lie down in green pastures, leads me beside quiet waters, renews my life. Okay, so the Good Shepherd Psalm, talking about the character of God. As you look down through this psalm, you see God as our guide. Show us the way. All we got to do is trust Him and follow Him. You see uh, the caring, loving aspect of God's character. You see His providing for us in there. Now, it's also protecting, but don't misunderstand that. He protects us spiritually, sometimes physically, but not always physically. Ask people who have, who have had a loved one who was a believer who died of cancer. God didn't save their life, their earthly life. Spiritually, they were protected, but maybe not physically. Uh, he disciplines us. That's another part of the character of God. So you can't just look at all the good stuff and ignore the bad stuff. You know, what, what I, he, it's not bad, but when you think of being somebody's going to ex, uh, uh, exercise discipline on you, that's kind of a negative thought. That's where I'm going with that. So anyway, uh, that's Psalm 23. Psalm 24, when you get to that and you read through it, it is he is the king of glory. It is all about God and his glory and what you have to do in order to be in heaven with him. Uh, who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? This is Psalm 24, verse 3. The one who has, verse 4, the one who has clean hands and a pure heart. And then you go on from there. So I like what the writer in the book said. He was talking about these three psalms, and he was talking about the, what's called the tenses of salvation. And real deep discipleship stuff gets into that. Old timey preachers used to talk about it. You know, you, you got saved from sin, you're in the process of being saved, you're going to be saved, you know, in heaven for all eternity. 
Well, this guy talked about this in Psalm 22. He said, we are saved from the penalty of sin. In Psalm 22, there's the Jesus picture on the cross, taking that burden of sin. Psalm 23, being saved from the power of sin. And you read down through Psalm 23, and yes, Satan has power in this world for now. But you see in verse 23, God guiding us through life and helping us through life. Psalm 24, the eternal king of glory, Psalm, we will be saved from the presence of sin because we'll be in heaven where there is no sin. All right. So saved from the penalty of sin, saved from the power of sin in the earthly life as we live it with Christ guiding us saved from the presence of sin in heaven. So you get that threefold picture there in these three songs. So I've kind of rushed through that. But. I think it's interesting in you know, Psalm 22, we all know that opening phrase, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we know that because Jesus quoted it on the cross. And, but I would, I would venture to say that Many of us, myself included, until a few years ago, because I never thought in this context of it, nobody ever challenged me in this, but we never thought about reading the rest of the psalm in light of Jesus on the cross. Now, we would say, well, verse 14, that's an easy one to look at because his bones are out of joint, and Clint gave you a very visual representation of that. And so we kind of see that. But we forget that, i, I give you an example. So if I were to say to you, four score, and seven. Every single one of you can finish that phrase, and you could probably go on for a few more minutes, or at least another paragraph or so, uh, because you know what I'm referencing. So when John and the rest of the disciples put down that Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There is probably in that the intention of the entire psalm, and not just a one moment, one off scream for help, which is Oftentimes when we're preaching the Gospels and we look at Jesus' suffering on the cross, we look to that point and we kind of, you know, well, Jesus, he, he finally had enough. Um, interestingly enough, George MacDonald, the old Scottish preacher, wrote different things, um, was said to be one of C.S. Lewis's greatest influences. George MacDonald had this to say about that phrase. He said that he believes that when Jesus said that, that is the culmination of his deity. And here's why. He said that he says, my God. Mm -hmm. He goes on to say, you've forsaken me. In other words, I feel left out. I feel abandoned. Every single thing in every single circumstances is saying to me that God has left you. God has lost you. God has, you know, done away with you. But yet, how did he refer to God? in a singular possessive my god i don't know that that's the correct english term but what i'm saying is he said it's mine and he referenced him as god so it was a call to who god's nature is and as clint was saying if you continue and you read that entire song and we should probably be just as familiar with that one as we are 23 uh, in light of the fact that it, it's the one jesus quotes on the cross if you begin to read the rest of that psalm in light of that, my goodness, look at it. I mean, yes, David is writing, he's writing, and yes, we can look back and say it's prophetic because he talks about the garments being divided and all those sorts of things. But then he goes to talk about the mouths of the lion and the horns and all those things. Those are emotional <coughs> experiences that, that Jesus would have been having on the cross. Um, which gets to the crux of the psalms for me. Is so many times the psalmist is telling God, what they are feeling and experiencing in that moment, which is something we usually only reserve for ourselves. We usually only tell ourselves how we feel, which means we don't have to be that honest. But when you start telling God how you feel, it it, it becomes overwhelming. Yeah. Yeah, if you got a true, for a lot of guys, y'all know here in America, a lot of us guys, we have trouble exp expressing our emotions sometimes, sometimes not, and that gets us in trouble, but but the real stuff, you know, I'm really hurting. Yeah, it's, you know, I'm yeah. really confused. Yeah. I'm really, that, that real personal stuff. And I, I tell people, talk to God like you're talking to me right now. Just tell him. He already knows. Just confess it. Get it out there. 
because God responds to that. Mm -hmm. He does. Yes, he does. And we're going to look at that in the next section, too, because of those are the Psalms of Laments. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, when you look at that verse 16 where it says, Dogs surround me, a pack of villain encircles me. We have a, we, I, we have a tendency to ascribe things away from us. So we say, well, this group is doing this and they're hurting me. And this group is doing that and that's hurting me. Um, but what David is doing is he, is he is bringing this to bear on himself and he is noting it. And, and then Jesus does the same thing when he uses this psalm on the cross. He, he brings it to bear on himself and, and he reveals what is happening within himself. And I, but then he goes on to say, and this is the thing, don't miss it, because this, it, it, almost every psalm turns. If you read the psalms, they have a tendency. They'll start in one direction, and they'll turn in the other. And I find that to be true in my own life when I truly and really share what I'm feeling and thinking with God, that there comes a moment when a turning happens. And, and by turning, I mean simply a, a, a willingness, a trusting, a... I mean, I don't want to sound hyper-spiritual here because everybody knows I'm not. It's just this, when you become truthful and honest about yeah. what you're thinking and experiencing and tell it to God as if you think he cares about it, there is a there is a twist that happens within your own spirit. Because you have totally opened up to God. You're not holding back. You, it's no longer yours. Right. You, you, yeah, and so look what he says here. He says, verse 26, and I love this one. He says, the poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise Him. And may your hearts live forever. I mean, this is that's the that's the turn, which then leads us. And they didn't just take these psalms and say, oh, "Let's just throw them all together." These were people steeped in the Jewish tradition, and they're like, "Well, you know what? Psalm 23 fits right after that. Mm -hmm. Let's go from this guy who is suffering and experiencing this great loss and this great torment, but yet God provides, and let's go to this other picture of this God who is just everyday present." And I forget the terminology you you use there to describe those two songs and how they blend together. But. Uh, uh, something I, I passed over a few minutes ago, and he alluded to it just a few minutes ago. There is a point, if you remember Jesus on the cross, in order for us to be saved from having to pay the penalty for our sins, there is this point where God actually pulls away. We always talk about as Baptists, Jesus was fully God and fully man. But right here you see it in the sense that God pulls his spirit away because sin and God cannot coexist together. Jesus was about to hold, hold the burden of sin for humanity and pay that, that price. So God pulls away. There are two places in Scripture that I know of where you see the agony of somebody when that happens. There might be others, but I remember these two always. Jesus on the cross suffering an agony not just physical but spiritual deeper than any of us could probably ever imagine and Saul when God took his spirit away from Saul what happened to Saul he lost his mind it was such a change he went crazy basically so Jesus paid an awful price there for us and we don't want to miss that and David is actually describing that here in this song. A lot of times we miss that entirely though. The interesting thing there is Saul lost his mind because he thought that God's presence was dependent upon his ability. Mm -hmm. Jesus proclaimed God's faithfulness mm -hmm. in his loss. You know, Saul said, what's happened to me? And Jesus said, my God, my God. Yeah. And this is a place of dependence, which means that the loss there was a loss that, that he felt, but it wasn't a loss that was a reality. It was, it was a loss that he just, in the, in the sense of, you know, I, I'm blessed my father's still alive. Um, I know many aren't, but that would be watching this and all. But So if I reference my father, I'm referencing someone who physically can still interact with, with me. Um, Others who may have lost their father would be referencing something that they did in the past or some hope that they have for the future. Um, Jesus was making his claim in the present that this is my, this is my God, this is my father. Um, and uh, to me, that's just a beautiful picture. And, uh, for George McDonald, who 
can twist theological terms in ways I can't even begin to understand. And these principles look, look plain. Um, for him to look at that as a moment of great divinity, or great Jesus' statement of deity, and it's, it's an interesting way to consider that passage. I like kind of why you finished up a few minutes ago. It's kind of how I tried to finish up a, a, a prayer meeting the other night. You got Psalm 22. And one way of looking at it, there's a lot of bad stuff in Psalm 22. Mm-hmm. Psalm 23 comes. Oh, that's a whole lot better. You feel a whole lot better reading it. Yeah. And then Psalm 24 is to come. Yeah. Uh, and 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 you got a you got the three parts there: saved from the penalty of sin, saved from the power, being saved from the power of sin, and will be saved from the presence of sin in the future. Yeah. So that's our first section there. It's a good reminder of God's faithfulness, and we hope that you'll. Grab your Bible and read through those psalms. And as Clint said, if you want a copy of this book, we'll be happy to get it for you.